Praise the Lord, saints. We are beginning a new series today entitled Finishing Strong, A Tale of Two Endings. Once again, Finishing Strong, A Tale of Two Endings. And our text scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for giving us the opportunity to study your word. And we praise you, Father, that as we go through various aspects of our lives, Father, both in the current situations that we face, the things that are upcoming, and then as we look toward our future, even into the final days that we're blessed to be here, we have a desire that we would finish strong in all of our endeavors, not just the individual pursuits, the individual battles, but as we look at our overall lifetimes, Lord, let us finish strong so that you would be, you would approve of us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We thank you, Father, for this and all the things that you'll teach us via your word. And we give the praise, honor, and the glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we're talking about a tale of two endings, which means that obviously you can pursue various things. And first of all, you need to finish. And then second of all, if you finish, you need to finish it in a strong manner. As we look at our text scripture here, it talks about us running a race. And, you know, in your everyday regular races, there's only one champion. One of the blessed things about us serving God and his kingdom is that we can all run our various races. And each one of us can be a champion as long as we, once again, finish the race, run the race on the course he set before us and then we can receive the prize. So one of the things we see first is that we need to run that we may obtain. Don't go into the race saying like, well, I'll just kind of mosey along and hope I get to the finish line. No, we need to run so that we can obtain the prize. And one of the things we see there going down to verse uh, 26 and 27, it talks about, I don't fight as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under subjection. And as I read that, it reminded me of when I played college basketball and we used to have these sprints before the beginning of practice, well, at the start of practice and at the end, he would make us do uh, four corners drills or various sprints. And if you came in last, you had to do some extra laps. So needless to say, Brian Fox was not coming in last. <laughs> and the reality, though, is that a lot of times I came in first or I was close to it. But then one day, the coach took me to the side, and he said, Brian, you always do run well with that, but you, you want a, a little tip that will make you do even better? And I said, sure. So he said, when you run, he said, your head, I guess because of the you know exhaustion factor or how we got pushed throughout the practice, and sometimes he would make us go extra hours and we wouldn't get a lot of water, and people had cramps sometimes, that sort of thing. He said, Sometimes we were all pushed so hard that by the, by the end of the practice when we did the sprint, he noticed that I was running and winning or coming in second or third. But as I was running, sometimes my arms were flailing a little bit and sometimes my head was going side to side, you know, maybe as a, in a means to bring in more oxygen. But he said, if you keep your head straight, control your breathing and keep your arms tucked in tight, you'll probably come in first all the time. So you may even finish the course, but do you just beat the air and your arms are waving around <laughs> ineffectively? Are you efficient in the course that God has before you? Those are some of the things we need to look at. Um, the word race here 
in our text scripture is a stadium or race course. A stadium or a race course. That's something we're accustomed to. It also talks about a certain measure of distance. So are you able to complete things over a certain length of time? It's one thing for you to say, okay, I ran well in a few minutes. Short distances or a sprint. But are you in the race for the whole length of time or do you fizzle out at a certain point? So as we go through this series, one of the things and one of the primary things which Elder Pam actually, um, Lord, um, placed upon her heart, share, she shared with me is that we're going to examine two major biblical leaders, amen, and we're going to contrast the outcome of their lives. But before we do that, we're going to look at some foundational principles relating to running our race and walking in leadership with God successfully. If you look at the pattern of discipleship in the Bible, you didn't have a bunch of people following Jesus, Paul, you know, the various people for 10, 20, 30 years and still being immature. No, the pattern of discipleship was really quick, you know, several years. And then you were out there on your own walking in ministry. And it's not a case of you necessarily having to be uh, a pastor of a church, being behind a pulpit. But even if you don't hold a particular or official spiritual position of authority within the body of Christ, each of us should still be mature enough that we can walk in God's principles as leaders, either before our Christian brethren who aren't quite as mature or who are new converts, or before unsaved people. They should have something that they can aspire to. They should be able to see that if I need somebody in my life as a pattern or a model of stability, I can look at that life of this person. Amen. If we're not running the race well, they see instability in our lives. And we have to ask ourselves, once again, if we've been saved and serving Jesus Christ for a long time, are we walking with stability and maturity that other people can follow the pattern of our lives and we help guide them into a mature and stable relationship with Christ? Or are we all over the place and we don't give them anything to mimic? We have to I'll be honest and examine that. We also have to realize that just because we won a specific race here or there, sporadically, it doesn't mean that we've necessarily finished any phase of our life or looking at our overall lifetimes, we have not necessarily necessarily finished strong. You know, if I, if I race in the Indy 500 and I win it one year, guess what? The next time that race comes around, it's nice that you won the Indy 500 Last year, Brian Fox, guess up. Guess what? You at the starting point of the race just like everybody else. You got to run again and run well. <laughs> uh, so we can't fall back on the laurels of something that we did in the past. No, each individual one requires us to have the mindset that every conflict, every contest needs to be met with the same level of zeal in order for us to succeed and we have to continue to retain the attributes, the character, the qualities that enabled us to win in the past. Matter of fact, even more, we need to learn from the strengths and weaknesses, the things that we did well and the things that we did poorly. And you may have come out of that fight with a championship belt around your waist or a crown on your head. But don't think that you were perfect and you didn't need to refine the ways in which you won the last battle. No, it's an ongoing process that you have to keep cultivating your gifts and your skills, realizing that you're not perfect. I wasn't even on this subject this week, but one of the things um, Sifu Maza said um, as he was taking us through various drills, he says, these are the things I do every day for the first two hours I wake up. And he took us through one hour of it. And he said, really, that's my starting point. You know, I made you all through this class do a thousand punches, crunches, sit-ups, different things. He's like, I'm just getting my first sweat when I do 10,000 punches. And he said, when he finished fighting at 48 years old, when you professionally fight, most people retire due to injuries or they just can't keep up with the up-and-comers. 
in their 20s or 30s. He fought his last fight professionally at 48, and not just one fight, he fought four different people and beat them all. But it's because he said, I had the mindset that every time I went in there, I treated it as if it was my first fight. I didn't assume anything. I didn't look back at all my belts and all my pictures and all my, you know, I went to this part of the world. I fought here and I fought there. I'm so wonderful. I could just step in the ring. He said, no, I treated that as if it was my first battle. And because of that, he finished strong. Matter of fact, the only reason he really retired is because his wife said, hey, we got a child. It's time to end those days. So he finished strong. And that's a model that we can take as well. Is it your first fight? Is it your hundredth fight? Still treat it without any assumptions of victory, but instead focus, prepare yourself, treat it with respect, and then give it your all. And not only learn from your losses in the past, but learn from your victories. You can still learn ways in which you can refine what you've done. Amen. My brother is another person. He just finished his 10th marathon in his 50s. So you can continue to go out there and you can run races. You know, if somebody could fight a fight in 48, run a marathon in their 50s, look at the kingdom of God as we see various leaders in their 80s and stuff like that, literally going to war and winning great battles. But we have to equip ourselves and we have to have the right mindset. All right, for the first subtopic that we're going to examine under this, one of the things we're going to look at is that you may forfeit the race if you start too early. You may forfeit the race if you start too early. And we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's two key words that really caught my attention here, you know, and of course there's a wealth of things that we can learn. One of the things we see starting out is that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Do you realize that you're, when you're engaging in battle, you're in a stadium from a spiritual perspective where those who have won in the past are looking down, amen, um, from heavenly places. God is looking down upon us, so we are performing in a competition or a conflict against the kingdom of darkness. And we need to realize that, you know, the way in which we engage in battle, amen, has to be done in an honorable fashion. We see here that there's anything that's weighing you down, um, holding you back, or something that will hinder your progress, whether it's physical attachments connected to you, emotional things, attitudinal things, any type of strongholds or other barriers that will hold you back from being able to run your race with fervency and w by placing all your energy and your zeal into achieving the outcome as opposed to being held back by those things, you need to lay aside every weight. Sometimes weight is good to fortify you, but when you're running that race that God has before you, you know, don't allow those things to hold you back and hinder you. You have to lay aside. And notice that it says, let us lay aside. Don't sit back saying, well, I'll run the race, but God, could you take this off of me? No, God said, I've given you the tools. You lay aside the weight, which will so easily hold you back or beset you. And the word beset means to surround you on every side. You remove all the weights and the anchors. There's sometimes in training that we would... Um, work on our stamina, somebody would attach um, either one of our training belts around us and pull back as we try to run forward and they would be pulling us back. And sometimes you see people with elastic bands that do that sort of thing where you're in a gym and you're trying to run forward and somebody's pulling you back. But when it comes time for the race, you gotta take that thing off. 
It's blocking you. Amen. Um, it's, it's hindering you from being able to run to the fullness of your capability. So you have to lay aside every race. And then not only do you need to lay aside every weight, as well as the sin that can beset you, but a key phrase that we need to focus on as it relates to us walking in victory and leadership is that it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, we don't like patience. <laughs> that word patience means endurance in the underlying Greek. Let us run with endurance. We like the quick finish. Oh, God, I don't, I don't mind running the race for you. But can I just do the 100 meter or the 100 yard dash? <laughs> what? I got to do the mile long or a marathon? No, thank you, God. Uh, can't you pick somebody else for that? You know, I just want the short race. Every battle I fight needs to be quick. I get in there, bam, bam, bam. Battle's over, and I can celebrate with my crown on my head. No. Sometimes we have to run with endurance. That race is not going to end quickly. You got to stay in the trenches. You have to fight. And there might be setbacks that you have to deal with, but yet you still have to rise up. Even if you've been knocked down and said, no, I'm not quitting. You're not getting a technical knockout of me. You may have knocked me down, but I'm getting back up and I'm getting back into this thing to win. So I'm, I'm fighting and I'm having endurance. The word patience also means constancy. Or we would think in our modern phrases, consistency. Let us run this race with consistency. Okay, yeah, you, we understand you, you won that battle two months ago. But are you consistent? Mm -hmm. If something reemerges or something else is on the horizon, or if you're suddenly struck by a new conflict or placed on another course or race to compete for the prize, do you have the consistency that you're ready to run that race? Or did you lose the last one? Some, and sometimes you even won the last one, but once you won it, you threw off your sneakers, kicked up your legs and said, I'm done training. Only to find out that there's another race. One of the things you see a lot of times in the martial arts world, sometimes people who don't have that, that zeal and that hunger for the art, they say, well, once I get my black belt, I'm quitting. Well, wait a minute, that's just the next phase of your journey. It's a major accomplishment. Yeah, you worked hard. You probably had injuries you over, overcame, but did you really love it if as soon as you won the battle, you quit? You know, same thing spiritually. Do you really love God if you win the prize and then you say, okay, I can retire now? <laughs> Serena Williams pretty much had to get dragged off the tennis court to retire. Tom Brady retired and came back <laughs> and is still playing. LeBron, you know, he's old by NBA standards, still, you know, all-star level player. But, you know, even those who love him the most say, hey, he's lost a step, even though he's still going. But you kind of got to drag those people kicking and screaming to the day of retirement. Why is it sometimes as believers we say, I won that race, I fought that fight, and I'm the victor. Now I can rest on my laurel, laurels and retire. No. <laughs> the day we retire is when God says we've retired. Amen? And once again, we see in the Word over and over again, people that we would think would be at their retirement age, they're literally going out on the battlefield, leading the fight. Not sitting back as a general, Hey, send the troops here and there and go fight. And here's the knowledge I have over the years to share so you can gain the victory. No, they grab a sword and they get out in the field and win the battle themselves. We don't age out and retire in the kingdom of God, in other words. Amen. And you may choose to do that. But did God retire you? Because even if you're not out there with your sword and your shield, your bow and arrow or your spear, you can still be engaged and sharing the insight that God has enabled you to glean over the years to be able to help other people. Let us run with patience, endurance, consistency. One thing that's really important, though, as we see here, let us run with patience. 
Um, and our subtopic, you may forfeit the race if you run too early. Um, sports such as track and field or swimming, when you start the competition, you typically get on these things called starting blocks. And I'm not sure if they, I think they still use them, like starting starter pistol or some kind of sound, a, a horn blows. And when that, you know, when you first get up to the blocks, you angle your body, you lean down. Swimmers usually are bent down with both their hands touching their toes. Track and field st stars, they're kind of like, you know, one knee is bent, one other leg is back, and they have their hand down on the block. And as soon as that sound goes, boom, they go flying out of the starter gates. But here's the thing. Sometimes a runner will start early and they get a warning. Okay, everybody back, false start, everybody back on the blocks. And if somebody continues to have a false start, eventually they'll be disqualified. We gotta make sure we're not on God's starting block or God didn't even say the race is about to occur yet and we're running out there to run a race or fight a battle and God didn't even tell us to get in position for the race at hand. And then even if God tells you to get on the starting block, did he sound the alarm for you to engage in the race? Or are you on the blocks and you still need to wait until God gives you the, the, the signal to enter the fray? Sometimes people in the body of Christ lose battles because, number one, they jump off the blocks ahead of time with a false start. Or maybe they're not even in the right race. And even if they are suited for a particular competition, you know, it's one thing, uh, maybe you're supposed to be over <laughs> at some type of smaller category race and you showed up at the Olympics. You're in the right sport, but you're at the wrong venue. We got to let God lead us on the races that we run. Don't put yourself out there in a competition that he did not call you to or you're not ready for. That's why a lot of sports, they have qualifying rounds or qualifying competition. Oh, we're going to see if you're ready for the Olympics. But before you get here to the Olympics, oh, you got to play over here first against 50 other teams or athletes. And once you show yourself to be the cream of the crop, then you can graduate over into the final competition. You got some people, unfortunately, the body of Christ, like you're supposed to do the qualifying rounds and they'll – I know I'm very spiritual. I'm a warrior for the kingdom of God. And you heading right over to the Olympics and God's like, right. <laughs> you're going to be out of the contention very quickly because you took on a level of competition that you were not suited for. Amen. The word race here, let us run with patience to race. So one of the key things about patience is a willingness not only to be consistent and to train yourself to have endurance, but you have to have the patience to say, I'll wait until it's my turn. Hmm. And sometimes you can starve if you're just willing to wait. The number of players in the NBA is like, man, where this kid come from? Oh, he's been on the bench for the last two years. He wanted to play. He wanted to get out in the court. Coach said it, he wasn't ready. And somebody gets injured, and the coach is required to put him in. And because he was hungry, but still willing to listen, even though he didn't get to play, still willing to go to practice every day and listen to the coach's instructions, sometimes even sitting on the bench, sitting there like, why can't I get a few minutes? Then the time comes, person is put in, and they excel. Amen? Amen? Sometimes there's strength and a lot to learn, a lot of benefits to be, being patient and waiting for the timing of the person that puts you out there in a the race. Are we willing to wait for God's timing? Are we too anxious? You know, once again, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Make sure the race is set before you instead of you running out and finding one. And then here we see, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And you know, we run with patience. First of all, we, want, we run the race that is set before us, 
But then we see here, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He tells me where to run. He tells me when to jump out of the starter block. I wait for his signal in terms of the timing of everything that I need to do. I'm not building my own race course, gathering the competitors, defining the rules, and then running the race the way in which I see fit. No, I'm following the instructions of somebody who set the course out before me. And then also keeping in mind, even when he's permitted me to join the race, I'm looking at the coach. Am I ready? How should I start? Where should, how should I go? When do I begin? I'm looking under him. I don't get become cocky, in other words, and say, okay, now I'm in the competition. Ha, I got this. No, looking unto Jesus, the ultimate coach, author, and finisher. The race here, as we see, is an assembly, a contest. It can refer to effort, contention, anxiety, or fights. <coughs> Run with patience. And, you know, it's funny, the word in the beginning, the text scripture is different than the word race here, even though they seem to be the same. But sometimes we have to run with patience as we deal with various content, contests. Sometimes there's different levels of effort. There may be sometimes situations where we may face anxiety, but we, want, we, we, we run with patience. We don't let the anxiety control us. We continue to look to Jesus to show us how to overcome it. And once again, contention or fight. So as leaders within the kingdom of God, it's critical that we know how and when we should engage in various races or battles because we can suffer losses if we get ahead of God's signal to start. And as I said earlier, some believers may actually be losing races that they began because God didn't grant them permission to even participate in the competition at hand or they've shown up at the wrong location even if they're gifted in the particular area in question. Praise God. All right, so our next subtopic is going to be the fact that you have to train yourself to lead and live victoriously. You have to train yourself to lead and live victoriously. Well, some people think, I know I'm a leader. I believe I'm a leader. So therefore, I am a leader. Because that's what I perceive. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> Most of the time, people really cannot be good leaders until they've been led. And you learn the pros and cons of those things. Amen? Um, best way to be somebody who walks in authority is to be previously submitted unto authority. And you can learn, you know, the way, you know, you have like the Elijah, Elisha situation. And then you have a negative situation like David and Saul, where you learn what not to do. Um, but either way, the best of leaders have already submitted themselves up under the leadership of somebody else for all the pros and cons. And it gains them knowledge on the way in which they will do it when their turn uh, emerges. And once again, it's not something where you flip a switch and you go from being an amateur, a novice, a beginner, a new convert, and all of a sudden, flip the switch, I'm a leader. No, this is something you need to grow in, you need to cultivate, you need to go through various things. Sometimes you need to know what you're made of. You stumble, fail miserably, even embarrass yourself. Oh, we're going to see what kind of leader you are. Do you get up or do you feel sorry for yourself 
recoil in pain and walk away never to try again. You know, a leader is not somebody that gives up because they fail. You know, sometimes with leadership, you are going to fail. Sometimes you're going to take a hit. And sometimes you got to be willing to take a hit even when the hit isn't even, isn't even there. I remember one time um, dealing with this younger engineer. His name's Dallin. We're in this project, and we had a bunch of roadblocks to start the project. And um, the client was very nice. You know, they realized that the environment was not, you know, well-structured, and there was going to be some hurdles and setbacks to deal with. So it was nothing like bad on their end, but this one particular day, I couldn't make the meeting. And he was a little concerned about like, when I tell them this, um, you know, is it possible they might finally get tired or upset and react negatively? So I told him, I said, look, I said, um, I can't make the meeting. I wish I could. And if something changes, I will make it. But I said, in case I don't make it, and the tone of the meeting goes in that direction. I said, here's what you say, and you put it on me, and you say that Brian will address your concerns later after I note them. So I told him, no, you don't take the hit. I'm the leader, even if I'm not present. Mm -hmm. If things go bad, here's what I want you to say. Say this specifically. And then you put it on me, and you say Brian will address this stuff later. So I was like, even if I'm not present, I still had the mindset that I'm still the leader. And if somebody got to take a hit, I may not be physically there, but emotionally, spiritually, whatever it needs to be, I'm standing in between me, you, and those people, and I will take the brunt of whatever consequences, criticism, whatever. Didn't happen. <laughs> but the fact is, I was willing to take away his concerns, tell him that, if anybody had to take any kind of negative review, place all the burden, all the criticism on me. You know, don't sit there and take it. Just tell them, like, hey, Brian, this is what Brian said. He'll address everything. So all I'm doing is reporting to you. I'm taking notes and putting this on Brian's plate, and he will deal with you later. Once again, fortunately, that did not happen. They've been pleased with us. Um, since that time, we've done a lot of great things. And actually some stuff that wasn't expected, but that's a sign of leadership that you're willing to stand in the gap. You're willing to stand in the front of your troops. You're willing to take the hit and the consequences of decisions or problems and whatever things may occur. You're willing to stand up front as opposed to blame shifting or allowing somebody else to take the consequences of things that go wrong. Um, so once again, you have to train yourself in order to do this. This is not something that just comes naturally. And I'm not saying that some people don't have the capacity within them, the characteristics to be leaders, but they still have to be trained in the process of leadership itself. So we're going to look at Jeremiah 12, verse 5. And it says, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? And if in the land of peace, wherein thou trusteth, they weary thee, then how wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? So this puts it back into a racing analogy. <laughs> if you can't run with people on foot, and you know, you, you get out the starting block, you're running, and everybody's blowing ahead of you, and you're falling behind, if you can't keep up with people on feet, on, on foot, how in the world do you think you're going to be able to run if somebody's on a horse? You're just not ready. And you got to be able to look at yourself and say, hey, I'm not able to contend. I'm not able to keep up with people in that type of race. Um, and then it says, hey, if you become weary in a place where, for the most part, everything is peaceful, but you're like, oh, I'm so, I'm so exhausted. I'm so way down like if you're feeling that way in a place that's peaceful why in the world would you think you can go to the place where there's adversity um, turmoil catastrophes and other things occur you just can't you got to be able to run with st stability um maturity confidence and comfort in a situation that is of lesser um, intent 
or impact before you can go into circumstances where the level of competition or conflict is greater. That's basically what it's telling us here. Um, and that makes sense, you know, um, spiritual level. You can't lead a bunch of people in their life spiritually and help overcome various conflicts that they're dealing with if you find that you're unable to sustain the various things that come at, at you, both known and unexpected, in your own life. you got to be able to weather those storms. And we all go th through times of um, success and peace. We also go through times of great adversity. Um, but in order to know it, without a shadow of a doubt that you can lead others on how to navigate those things, you at first have to be able to do it in your own life. Um, you don't need a sinking boat <clears throat> to come into the aid of a sinking ship. Repair your own boat, <laughs> keep it navigating the sea or whatever before you go to tug or repair or save people from another boat that is going down. Amen? Even on a plane, you know, those warnings that a lot of people ignore. They say, we have a loss of cabin pressure, blah, 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 and a face mask. Drop down, put on your mask first before you put on the mask of somebody adjacent to you. Why? Because if you're about to pass out from a lack of oxygen, it'll be kind of hard for you to stabilize somebody else that might be freaking out. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And you're trying to put a mask on them. No, stabilize yourself. Okay, now, even if I need to restrain that person or do something to hold them down while I get the mask on, I can do it for them because I've already stabilized myself first. Amen. Uh, let's go to another one. Proverbs chapter 24, 10. And it's one line, but I think it makes it plain. Proverbs 24, 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. I mean, I think it's pretty clear. <laughs> You're not strong. If when you're facing adversity, it's like, oh, I'm swooning, <laughs> or I'm freaking out, or I'm running, or curling up in fetal position, or crying myself to sleep every night. Your strength is not, it's small if you're not able to handle the adversity you're facing. Does that mean you're, you're weak in every area? Not necessarily, but in that particular area, your strength is small if you're not able to sustain the weight of whatever issue, turmoil, or adversity that you're facing. But it never says here that you need to just accept that and stay in that condition. It's basically giving us a warning. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. But it doesn't say stay weak. No, it's basically warning us that, you know, if you find you're being anxious about something that can occur, your strength is small, but if you're wise, you'll say, okay, I recognize the fact that I'm weak. Now let me take the necessary measures to ensure that I'm not fainting when adversity comes in the future, whether it's of the same type of trials and tribulations or if it's something else. Let me make sure that I'm not weak. I recognize my weakness, mm -hmm. but let me do something about it. <clears throat> I found something in the preacher's homiletical, which is um, really good. Um, once again, the preacher's homiletical says, No man knows his moral strength until he comes face to face with trial. The chain that holds the vessel to the quay is only as strong as the weakest link. And if that one gives way, the vessel is loosed from her moorings as surely as if every link was broken. Notice that. It says if one link breaks, it's the same impact as if all the links were weak. 
the ship is still loose and now about to float off. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of like, okay, the chain has, you know, a hundred links and 99 were strong. Just the one gave out. The boat's still heading out the water. <laughs> Who cares that the other 99 were strong? It's either all 100 need to be strong or we're in trouble here if one breaks. So anyway, um, going on, so it says, if the one gives way, the vessel is loose from her moorings as surely as if every link was broken. So human character is only as strong as its weakest point. And if a severe strain is brought to bear upon a man, he will break down there. So once again, just like the ship, if one link in the chain breaks, it really doesn't matter if the other 99, 100, 1,000, whatever links were solid, the breaking of the one link negates or nullifies the fact that everything else was strong because the ship is still about to float out the sea or crash. Same thing with the man's moral character as we see here. You know, you could be strong in every area, but if you had that one weak link, that could be enough to make the entire man fall. Look at Samson. Physically strong, could kill hundreds of people. Suffered in an area of lust, and it led to him being, you know, hair cut off, blinded, and eventually his death because of the one link in his emotional chain or his character. <clears throat> so we go back to it. So human character is only as strong as its weakest point, and if a severe strain is brought to bear upon a man, he will break down there. In the day of adversity, every virtue and excellence that we possess will be subjected to a severe test. And if only one of them is found unequal to the trial, the whole character suffers, and we are in danger of losing our hold upon God, and so... Drifting from the right course. And then it continues. A man may have a high opinion of his own physical strength and fancy that he is well able to grapple with any foe who might attack him. But it is not till he is in the grip of his antagonist that he knows how much or how little he is able to do and to bear. If he finds himself on the ground Stunned and bleeding, he rises from the struggle with a lower estimate of his own muscular strength than he had before. And so it is with the inner man when the day of adversity overtakes it. We think that our faith and moral courage are equal to any emergency, but we are sometimes stricken down to the dust and faint from the weight of a blow which we thought beforehand we could withstand, and for the rest of our lives have less confidence in our spiritual strength. <laughs> Long story short, <laughs> don't be too big for your bridges. <laughs> That's what it really comes down to. Um, but look at that. You can think I am strong physically, emotionally, spiritually. I am strong, I am a champion. I am valiant. I not only fight for me, but I can fight for other people who are being victimized. But it says here, the the reality is that you really don't know the true test of your physical strength, your moral character, your emotional and spiritual strength. You don't know the fullness of it until it's been tested in combat. You can assume that you're the strongest, you're a champion, Oh, I can handle anything, and I stay attached to God, and I'll be faithful and true, and you'll never make me deny or walk away or, you know, retreat from a spiritual battle. But you don't know that until you face an opponent that pressure tests you and makes you say, whoa, I've taken on a few blows that I didn't expect. Or I've taken on blows, and I didn't realize the opponent could hit or grapple that hard or be that strong. You don't know the measure of um, how valiant and strong you are, once again, whether it's in the physical, the emotional, or the spiritual, until your strength has been tested by an opponent of, well, 
Actually, it doesn't even have to be of the same level. Some people are just cocky and think, oh, I can fight anybody. And some little tiny person comes in and knocks you out. <laughs> He's like Deanne, uh, Deanne Rivers. No, you can't fight. <laughs> she used to talk about stuff she would see out in the streets in Philly. And sometimes it'd be the main person talking the most, the most trash. And the next thing you know, they laid out on the ground. Like, you know you can't. And she used to say, you know you can't fight. Obviously, they didn't know that, Deanne. <laughs> they thought they could fight. They found out later on, after they took a couple strikes to the face or whatever, that, oh, I can't fight. <laughs> or I can't fight as much as I thought I could. <laughs> it was just a, a good moment, though, Deanne. You know you can't fight. <laughs> She's always <all> saying, <laughs> oh, Lord. And I remember one time, there's these two uh, people she knew in her neighborhood that were small in stature, and somebody bigger tried to start something. Well, they know they can fight. They took it to that person. <laughs> That's, you know, he's running. <laughs> so you picked on the, the, the wrong people. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, anyway. So it just shows, though, like, we can think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. So walking in humility is actually one of the greatest forms of strength that we can have. No, I have not figured it out. No, I cannot face every opponent. No, I don't, I don't know without a shadow of a doubt, you know, in and of myself, if I can win every battle. However, if we're humble and say, I know I can win every battle because my God, who will empower me to overcome even my shortcomings, then you can have the confidence that in the day of adversity, my strength will be large because I'm not trusting in, in my own strength. Once again, whether it's my physical strength, my spiritual strength, or my emotional strength, you know, my strength is going to be huge because I'm not trusting in me. I'm trusting in the Lord, Lord that I serve. Um, but I really enjoyed that passage from the, the preacher's homiletical. It really brings out, you know, the fact that you may think you're strong in an area. And, and here's the thing. It talks about um, you, you end up on the ground. Maybe you thought, like, I can fight and I'm always going to stand on my feet. Oh, but I never trained myself on the ground. Now I'm in trouble. So don't assume. And that's why, um, as we're saying in the subtopic, you have to train yourself to lead and to walk in victory. Amen. You can't just wait for a battle and say, oh, I'm ready to go. or I'll start training now. It's too late. It's too late once the, the trial and tribulation is on. You need to train in advance of the conflict. And here's the thing. You may not even know the form of the conflict. Amen. You know, you might be training, or training your muscles and everything, training your endurance by running. Um, and, you know, you assume that you'd be fighting on the ground. Oh, I'm fighting on water or in the air. Well, at least you train yourself some. You can probably adjust under the leadership and inspiration of the, of the Holy Spirit. But train. Amen. Don't assume that you're ready for battles. Make sure that you train yourself. So we need to build up our spiritual, our emotional, and of course our physical strength in advance of every trial as much as possible to ensure that, as we saw in our initial example, no weak, weak link causes us to go off course from God. And sometimes we may think, once again, uh, there's 100 links, 99 of my links are strong, and well, I realize that that one link is weak, but you know, I'll hide that in the back or I'll put other links around it to ensure that it never gets hit or, you know, I'll get to it at some point. Yeah, it's unlikely somebody will ever hit me in that area of my life. So I'll just focus on the 99 strong ones. Guess what? That enemy will find that, that one link and will send a, <laughs> ambushments, a bunch of attacks and will keep hitting it and hitting it, and hitting it. Amen? So we need to focus on all the links. It's like that. What was that show, The Weakest Link? <laughs> Just focus on them all. It's funny because, like, in my level of training Wing Chun right now, he's actually training me to target specific pressure points, areas that you wouldn't think somebody would normally strike. Those are the the specific things he has me focusing on now 
in terms of the attacks I would do. You know, and sometimes you think like, what's this got to do with my my liver mm -hmm. or my stomach? Like my stomach's down here. What's that got to do with my stomach? Sometimes a point of attack will affect you in a place that you don't realize. Mm -hmm. So same thing as it is in the physical, it typically it is in the spiritual. You may think, well, what's that point have to do with, you know, fear? That has nothing to do with fear, okay. And the enemy starts bam, 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 right in that area. And as you know, <gasps> overcome with fear. Strengthen all your points as much as possible. All right, next point is you may forfeit if you don't abide by the rules. You may forfeit if you don't abide by the rules. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Praise the Lord. So we see here... Um, one of the things says, I am ready to be offered. That phrase in the underlying Greek, it means to devote one's life or blood as a sacrifice. And then also means to pour out as libation. Once again, to devote one's life or blood as a sacrifice or to pour out as libation. For I am... Now ready to devote my life or blood as a sacrifice is what he is saying. You know, as we're leading, as we're serving God, are we willing to make that type of sacrifice? You know, are we willing to, you know, engage in battles the manner in which God would dictate? And are we willing, once again, as we see here in verse 7, I fought a good fight. You know, good fight is according to the rules and guidelines. You know, if you're a boxer, <laughs> other person comes in, they're got the gloves on, their wrists are taped up, and you come out with a knife or with no gloves, and you try to poke your opponent in the eyes, well, you might injure the opponent, but you're disqualified because you didn't fight according to the rules. Um, if you're running a race, we see here, I have finished my course. Um, if you're running a race and it has a specific path, you know, winding around a city or a park or whatever, and you say, well, shoot, you know, going on that, there's a bunch of curves in this race, so you know what, every time I'm getting near a curve, I'm just going to cut straight line to get to the opposite side of the curve and I'll win the race. No, you cheated. <laughs> yeah, everybody else could have taken that path, but no, they stayed on the course and they went around all the bends and the hills and stuff like that. And, you know, yes, it's an easier, more direct route, but, but you cheated. So you're going to be disqualified from the race. And notice there it says, I finished my course. You could say, God, I finished, I finished the race, Lord. Say, you finished that path. You, you traversed that area over there, that course, but that's not the race I put you in. You finished somebody else's race. You were on another track when you ran your track and field. No, that's not the course, the path that it had you on. So that's why it's emphasized here. I fought the good fight. I finished my course, not somebody else's, but the one that God has set for me. And then I've kept the faith. You know, there's times where you're in the course of life that you deal with adversity. And sometimes you can compromise and make life a little easier, cheat, do different things, barter, compromise with the enemy to try to finish your course. But he said, no, not only did I fight according to the rules, and finished the course that was set before me, 
but I retained my faith. I did not compromise in any area. And because of that, he says that he knows it is laid up for him a crown of righteousness. How are you going to get a crown of righteousness if you've been unrighteous? Doesn't even make sense. You might be crowned with something else. <clears throat> but you won't receive a crown of righteousness. Amen. So we have a choice in order to, in, in terms of how we handle the race that is set before us. And once again, that we stay on the race that God has set before us. We're not running somebody else's race. God wants you to be yourself. He wants you to follow the path that he set before you. And once again, follow it according to his guidelines. And talk about race. The next point I had was the fact that if your pace is wrong, you may exhaust yourself or fail to win or even complete the race. Amen. Your pace has to be correct. On our first black belt test, we had to run five miles within a certain amount of time. And the most I ran, because I don't like jogging, I find it extremely boring. If it's something you like, like my brother likes marathons, that's you, Keith. You got that. You never have to worry about big brother trying to beat you. I yield to your superiority in that area. You can have it. Because <laughs> I ain't doing it. <laughs> I'm proud of you. That's your sport. <laughs> now, basketball, he played, but I was the basketball guy more. Um, but when I had to run for my black belt test, there was two guys, a father and son, who ran just for exercise 10 miles a day. So they could almost sprint five miles. Mm -hmm. So when we started off on um, running that, I started at their pace, and for the first couple of laps, I was neck and neck with them. But the while, I was like, man, whew, starting to feel this. And then I thought about it, I was like, these guys literally told you they run 10 miles a day, not preparation of a black belt test, but they run 10 miles a day. It's like father-son enjoyment activity. So mm -hmm. it's foolish for you to try to keep up with them. They do this every day. They do double this every day. Mm -hmm. It's foolish to try to stay at their pace. So then I was like, you know, I'm back up, I'll back down. And I let them go ahead. And I was like, I'm gonna come in third. Say, like, those two do this like it's nothing every day. So it's not a thing to be ashamed of to come in right behind them. So I slowed my pace and they went ahead. And then because I start off with that fast pace like them, after a while, it was like, shoot. Am I even going to make it? So I started exhausting myself because I pushed myself too hard coming out the gate, keeping pace with people who are used to double. So I was like, man, now I'm in the predicament that, you know, am I even going to make it? And here's the thing. I knew that we were able to stop or walk. We just had to complete the race by a certain amount of time. But so I was already probably about near my third mile when I backed off. And I was like, well, shoot, I still got that time requirement. And I know I could walk since I'm kind of ahead of the rest of the pack, but I want to make sure I finish strong and come in third. So then it's just like, all right, slow your pace, control your breathing. And then that's when I was dealing with asthma at the time. It was cold out that morning. I had some hot chocolate I brought with me, but I felt like I was starting to wheeze. And I was like, oh, man, I'm just going to make it. I might not make it. So I sipped the, you know, some hot chocolate to take away, hopefully, the wheezing. And then I finally had to say, just, you know what, it's not another, you know, three miles or, you know, two and a half miles. It's like one more step, one more. I even preached a sermon that one more step because I could not look at the big picture anymore. I was like, I just got to get to the next step and I will not walk. I will jog every minute of this. But I'm doing it one step at a time. But it, I just learned, you know, I, I knew it, but. That was a literal example where because my pace was wrong getting out of the gate, I exhausted myself earlier than I should have by expending too much energy trying to keep up with people who did that normally. And it almost resulted in me failing to complete the race. Fortunately, my ego wasn't such that I tried to stay with them regardless. And I was like, you know what? Back off. 
and I was able to complete and I still came in third. But, you know, how many times do people start something at the wrong pace? And they exhaust themselves, they burn themselves out, and they just, I give up, I'm done. I'm, I'm not even gonna try to finish it. Or, you know, they, they, they exhaust themselves and, you know, they come in last place because they got out the gate using the wrong amount of energy, the wrong, looking at the situation with the wrong perceptions, and, you know, they flamed out. So you gotta watch that. Um, Book of Ecclesiastes talks about that. Um, verses 9 and 10, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 10 and 11. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. I returned and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Amen. Um, one of the things we see here is that whatever you put your hand to, do it with all your might. Don't be lackluster. Don't give them 50%. And I've actually been in situations like working at companies where like, I don't even like it here. They don't pay me right. So I ain't killing myself over this place. And, you know, and I'm just doing bare minimal. I had one time I was at a, uh, <laughs> my, my mom got me a job at this, this factory she worked at. And we were putting together these devices and somebody taught me the exact way, you know, in the end to solder in all these resistors, capacitors and run this wire through here. And it's a little tight in here. So you got to get it part way and take the pliers and pull it, thread it through and do this and that. And they taught me that and I started doing it. And I was putting them out, and they finished like maybe one device per day. So I got to the point where I was doing that. But then I started noticing certain patterns. I was like, well, shoot, this area where the guy says you thread it through here, and it's hard, and you needle those pliers and pull it through and wind it around and you know, do this and that. It's like, if I build this little part over here in advance and run the wire through it, and it's just hanging, when I place it here, I don't have to run the wire through it's just in place already, bam, bam, solder. And then I notice other things. <laughs> so as you know, I'm putting out probably like four, device, four or five devices a day when the pace for people who have been there for years were, were, was one. And so finally one day somebody came to me and said, hey, young, young man, let me, let me talk to you for a second. He takes me to the side, and I'm thinking they're going to be like, nice job, young man. He's like, yo, dude, you need to slow your roll. <laughs> You're making us look bad. You've only been here a minute. We've been here years, and you're putting out like five times the quota of everything else, of everybody else. So you need to slow it down. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, yeah, not going to happen. It's like I run, it, I run at the pace I know I can run, you know, and God gave me the mind to see certain things and to improve. And if you had a, I wasn't even saying then, but if you had the right, righteous, godly attitude, you'd be like, you know what? That young man came across something that, man, we never thought of that. He sees it from a different thing. So, you know, let's see the way he did it. And we can boost up the overall, you know, factory's productivity. <coughs> but no, you want to silence and shut down <coughs> what was right. And I was like, no, I don't, I'm not going to do that. So they just had to tolerate me for, you know, as long as I was there. But I was like, I got to do what I got to do. Um, I did it with my might. Um Sometimes it's physical might, and sometimes it's the gift of analysis and seeing different things. Uh, and then we see further on, the race is not to the swift. You know, sometimes you don't have to be first in line and run the fastest to win the race. Sometimes there's a blessing in the finish, finishing of it. I remember, um, I don't remember the people's names, but they had a, a disabled uh, Olympics, or the, the same, maybe it was an Olympics, a, a disabled event. And for this particular event, um, they allowed both genders. So it wasn't like men's event, women's event. So they're running in this race. And all of a sudden, um, this Nigerian woman sees this guy, I forget what country he was from, that was really struggling. And um, I think he was missing a hand too. And he was struggling with his water. So she was passing him. She noticed it. So she kind of went that. She slowed down. And then she helped him drink. 
And even though she had the capability to um, finish the race first or close to it, she stayed with him for the remainder of the race. Because to her, winning was, let me help this other person to be successful. And when they got to the finish line, it's like everybody was just like clapping for both of them as if they had won the race. You know, and you've seen other examples of that, you know, where, you know, sometimes the race is not uh, the simplicity of here's the crown or the goal, but sometimes there's things of greater value within the race that are also um, highly successful and can see, be seen as victories. So the race is not always to the fastest getting across the finish line. Sometimes it is to the person who runs the race the best. Are you concerned? And compassionate about the other racers. You know, we can't be in a place where the trophy is more important than the competitors. And yes, when you compete, you should be out to beat them. You know, they're out to beat you. But at the end of the day, if one of your fellow competitors is in trouble, the, the trophy, the belt, the championship, ring, gold, money should be of lesser importance than your fellow competitors. And because she saw that, she was still applauded at the end of that race. And I've seen other examples of that as well. People cramping out, somebody could have won, went back and put their arms around a person and got them limping across the goal line. So um, that's one of the things that's, that's great. Uh, so anyway, you start, if you start a race at too fast a pace, you may burn yourself out and become too exhausted to complete it. On the other hand, if you start too slow, you may fall behind so far that then you say, oh, man, I need to pick up my pace if I'm going to have any chance to win. And then that is the part that can result in you burning out and not completing a race. As a result, you know, as we're winning and racing for and competing and racing for God, amen, we need to listen to him and allow him to train us in regard to the proper um, pace for us. I'll enter the fray when God says it. And there's been times over the years, you know, um, both professionally, personally, and spiritually, that if we went according to the flesh, we would have left the situation and jumped into another situation out of frustration, but it would not have been the right timing and the pace. But because we stood back and listened to the Lord and let him lead us, he set the stage for us to grow as individuals, to learn the things we needed to learn, and to move into situations in his proper timing. And we could see, looking back, you know, the strength that was gained from those sort of things and doing it according to his pace. You know, so are you moving at a fast pace um, out of zeal for God or out of ego? or emotion, um, allow God to set the pace for you. And God may say, once again, like I did, um, fall back. Don't worry about somebody else getting across the finish line first. Fall back and run at my pace. And that is the ultimate victory. Let me see what time we got here. Um, I'll do one more for today. Um, we must be temperate in all things. <laughs> it says in our text scripture, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. The word temperate means to be able to exercise self-restraint. Able to exercise self-restraint or self-control. And Proverbs 25, 28 says, he that hath no rule over his spirit. It's like a city that is broken and without walls. It doesn't say, I, God, the Father, will rule over your spirit so that you could be fortified and live a peaceful life. No, it puts the ball and the onus on you. He that hath no rule over his own spirit. Why would he say that unless you do have the capacity to self-govern. And God will help you through his word and by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he will give you a check and various warnings to tell you the right way to manage yourself and exercise self-restraint. 
But at the end of the day, God has not made us automatons or board drones that are walking around like robotic with no emotions and we can't govern ourselves. No, God is part of how he created us in his likeness. He gave us free will. So he will direct you through his word and by his spirit on what is right and give you a check in your spirit before you can get to the point of exploding in anger that, oh, settle it down. God will try to he'll warn you and say, hey, whoa, put the brakes on that. Let off on the, on the throttle. But at the end of the day, God's not going to control you and push a stop button or put a restraint on your mouth or pull you back if you want to lash out in anger or foolishness. That's why the onus is on us. Given all the tools that God has given us, he that have no rule over his own spirit. Amen. You refuse to have rule of your spirit. It says you're like a city that is broken down and without walls. Instead of having a fortress around your city, protecting it from invading armies, because you refuse to govern yourself properly, your walls have collapsed. All the enemy hordes and influences and attacks are coming in, and you have no barrier protection you know, against what's coming. And once again, it's not because of God, it's because you did not exercise dominion over your own spirit. So as, as, as godly and mature people, as leaders, first over our own spirits and then over the lives of others, and it may not be straight up leadership over somebody, it could be serving once again as a role model and a mentor. And a mentor could be not only somebody who has come up under you. I've had people come to me and say, hey, I'd like to come under you, you know, as a, as a mentor. I'm mentor mentoring somebody right now, um, ex-military. Um, we just started last month. Um, so I have people I've done it with, and it's official. Um, this is going through an organization where they've got it marked down. Brian Fox and Deshaun um, have a mentorship, you know, relationship for the next year. Mm -hmm. So there's times where it's official. Then there's times where I have people come to me, and it's unofficial, but we check in from time to time, and I'm a role model to them and mentor. But then there's those quiet mentorships where somebody's just observing you, and you may not even realize you're a mentor. You know, I've said over the years that um, Mr. Rudolph or Rudy Bell was a, a role model to me. Uh, I grew up, you know, pretty spending countless days and nights and sleepovers at his house because I was best friends with his son, Creighton. Um, and also, he had a much older brother because they had him later on in life. And I saw Charlie as a big brother figure. Um, but I watched them. I never went to Mr. Rudy and said, um, I'd like you to be my role model. You know, not during my childhood, not during my teen or college years, and then not after I graduated college and stuff like that. I never officially went to him and said, you're my role model. But um, he actually did our taxes for a while and scared us all to death because that deep booming, booming voice, and you know you better come in here with these receipts. And <laughs> he got to scare Pam and Pat a little bit too. <laughs> with that booming voice. So it's just like, okay, before we go see Mr. Rudy, our receipts better be right. Because <laughs> that booming voice. Now he was loving, but still that booming voice. Um, but I went to him and said, hey, you've been a role model to me. See a, you know, a proud, you know, um, black man, well-disciplined, ex-army, golden gloves boxer, you know, just the way he carried himself. I said, you're like a role model to me. And that's how we should be living our lives, too. But if you have no rule of your own spirit, they see you always up in some conflict and some chaos and dysfunction and arguing. And you woke up on the wrong side of bed and everybody knows it. No, you don't have enough leadership qualities to govern the lives of somebody else. So if you want to, first of all, once again, build your walls back up or keep your walls stable to prevent tax from coming in, you have to rule over your own spirit. Sometimes instead of worrying about getting other people in check, you need to put the foot down on your own neck and say, no, you're not doing that. I know you feel like going to tell somebody off. No, uh -uh. I'm not going to allow you to go do that. You're going to walk in kindly, calmly, coolly, and say, God bless you, or give them a smile, 
and they say something to agitate you, and you feel like saying something back, and before something come out of your mouth, exercise dominion over yourself. No. Keep your mouth shut and just keep walking. Well, they're going to think I'm soft. Get over yourself. Control your emotions. Control your attitude. Amen. Jesus was harassed, criticized, mocked his entire earthly life here in the flesh. He never allowed himself to get outside of the control of his spirit, being in, in alignment with God's will and being focused on the goal that was at hand. He never let people get him out of character. And as we see here, we have the capacity to rule over our own spirits. Let's start in leading and ruling ourselves before we try to do that in the lives of other people. You know, it's, it's quite frankly, it's impossible for us to be godly leaders and role models to others if we cannot ex exercise control over our perceptions, our actions, and our emotions. The things which push your buttons trigger you or serve as catalysts, I'm sorry, catalysts for you to lose control should gradually dissipate and lose their power over you if you're truly maturing in Christ. If not, how could, if it wasn't possible for you to exercise rule over your own spirit, how could the early martyrs calmly accept death, walk into situations where they know they are facing death, be incarcerated and be singing praise to the Lord and ministering to their captors, you know, preach to people, I forgive you, in the midst of them being stoned to death. You know, these people all exercise control over their spirits. They submitted themselves to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, and they yield themselves to the power of God instead of yielding themselves to their flesh or their emotions. And as a result of that, you know, we have to walk in the same manner. And if people have are saying, well, I just don't, I, I can't control myself. I just, I, I'm triggered, or I'm, or I'm this, or I'm that, or they pushed the button from the past and they wounded me. No, you should get to the place, if you're maturing in Christ, where the word has come in, penetrated, purged out all the things that are wounds, and refilled you with his presence and his peace and his comfort, you know. So the question comes to play, like, if you're unable to exercise rulership over your own spirit, either did you fail to try it? Here's the other one. Do you enjoy walking in agreement with those, those things? Or are you immature? At a certain point, you've been serving the Lord for years and years. All those things that from the past that should have wounded, triggered, did whatever to you to get you out of character, those things should be gone. You know, once you're saved and subjected to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, at some point, those things should not have the same impact on you as they did years early. And it's sad because one of the things we've seen in the kingdom of God now, people that are professing Christ Christians are acting no better than people than that out there in the world. Well, they didn't, they, they ain't nobody would talk to me like that. Well, really? They talk to Christ like that? Well, you don't know, well, when they push that button, what it does to me? I know they put a nail through Jesus' <laughs> body and the spirit is, well, that came later. Well, I know they did that to Jesus. Ripped his beard, probably spat on him, cursed him, mocked him. He couldn't even get peace on the cross. But he never got out of character. So all this, oh, you just don't know how it impacts me. No, you don't know how you have not subjected yourself to the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Once you've been, you're a new convert to Christ, things should have that impact on you. But once you've been saved for a while and you really have brought in the Spirit of God and you're submitting yourself to the Holy Spirit, your first reaction when things come should not be, I'm triggered to, out, to, to have an outburst or lash out or do this or that. Your first response should be, what passage of scripture will keep me calm here? Okay, what does the word say I should do and how I should react? That should be what is triggered, not fleshly attitudes, emotions, wounds, outbursts, or whatever. So once again, if you've been saved for a while and that is not the initial reaction to things that go awry, you got to ask yourself where you're at with, with Jesus. You really do. Because those things should not have the same impact. You know, in him we live and move and have our being. And the word of God talks about us having a transformation 
more and more into his likeness. If we're trans transitioning and transforming more and more in his likeness, the things that impact us in the world, physically, spiritually, emotionally, as we tr take more and more in his nature, how are we still having the same results? It doesn't make sense. Either the word has an impact and a transformative effect on our lives in terms of our flesh, our spirit, and our emotions, or it doesn't, but make your choice. But at the end of the day, you can't blame the word. This really comes down to the person. Did you submit yourself to the word and the spirit of God? I've had stuff over the years, like somebody says this or something does this, like I want to lash out, but when things occur, the word of God should come to your mind. And that should calm your spirit. And even as it calm your spirit, it should control your behavior so that, you know, in your mind you could be like, I want to cuss you out, punch you in the face right now. But that scripture, <laughs> that scripture is making me exercise restraint from even myself. I'm not going to do what I feel like doing because of the word and yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we got to exercise control. And once again, if you're not able to do it, either you didn't try it, um, you're immature, or like I said, sometimes people, you know, I think sometimes people really enjoy it. I don't really want to be healed of that. I don't want to be delivered of that because there's a part of me in my flesh that enjoys when I get the freedom to go off on people. And then I come back and repent later. No, you need to stop enjoying your sin and your flesh. Get to the place where you don't have to come back and repent. And you submit yourself to the word and the spirit of God. Amen. All right, so we're going to stop with that today. <clears throat> so let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for everything that you're doing in our lives. And we just praise you, Father, that um, as we study this topic, finishing strong, um, a tale of two endings, Lord, that whether it's in a unique situation that's occurring currently, uh, something that's coming over the next few years, or if it relates to the conclusion of our lives, Father, we praise you, Lord, that in all these things we would run well, that we would run according to your guidelines, um, that we would yield ourselves to your spirit and your word, and that we would finish strong. And we just thank you, Father, for this. And, Father, if there's any areas where we've been coming up weak or inadequate, any areas where we have come into agreement with our flesh or the world system's way of viewing things, we repent of those things. And we ask you, Father, to show us what those things are because they are, quite frankly, weak links in the chain that the enemy can prey upon and use to break and send us off course. So we just thank you, Father, for this. We also praise you, Father, we've tried to get ahead of you or we've entered um, competitions and battles that were not the course that you set before us. We repent of that. And we ask you, Father, to show us the course that you have set for us. And also, even then, we would have the patience to move according to your will, your purpose and plan as, a, as opposed to leaping out of the starting, starting block ahead of time and disqualifying ourselves. We just praise you, Father, for all the things that you'll teach us. We praise you, Father, for newness of strength, um, for healing in our mind, bodies, and spirits, as well as maturity to enable us to uh, retain control and governance of our own spirits, that we could walk more in your likeness, as well as be the role models that um, and the ambassadors of Christ that you call for us to be before the world system. We just thank you for all, all these things, and we just praise you, Father, for all the things that we're yet to learn and uncover in this series. We thank you, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.